This sermon is titled Book Study Acts chapters 3 and 4 Be enriched as you listen All right good morning everyone I hope you came prepared We're doing the book of Acts uh, We saw it last Sunday and we requested everyone to please read a few chapters uh, Today we're going to do chapters 3 and 4 so I hope you have read chapters 1 to 4 before the service today in case you missed it or you haven't that's no problem we're not going to take an exam now <laughs> uh the sermon is online some notes are online so you can download it uh revisit anything that you wish to or in case you missed last Sunday's sermon you can always go and catch up on that online through our church website or in our church app Today's sermon notes are also available on our website and on the app, so you can open it. You're free to follow along using the notes. So, just a few points to uh, review, and then we get into chapters three and four today. The Book of Acts, as we said, was written by Luke, a physician during his time. And what is interesting is that Luke was Greek. He was not Jewish. He's the only non-Jewish writer in the entire Bible. The only non-Jewish person that God used. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And we said this last Sunday that as we go through the Book of Acts, there are two perspectives we want to develop. I want to be very clear about. The first one is about the DNA of the church. As we look at the book of Acts and journey through it, we want to get a clear picture of what the church is supposed to look like. What are the characteristics of the church that Jesus birthed, if you will, or established and that grew through the book of Acts, evolved through the book of Acts. So we want to understand what are the characteristics? What should the church really be? And of course the expression of the community of spiritual believers will vary from place to place because it's uh, contextualized it's part of that local community we use the language the culture of those days and times or of our days and times and so that's understandable but the key characteristics we want to recapture we want them to be a part of us so our goal is not only just to study the book of acts theoretically or historically but our goal is we want to live it we want to live the book of acts amen we want that to be part of us today the second important perspective we want to develop is about how god used his people to fulfill the great commission of course empowered by the holy spirit So how did people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit fulfill the great commission of evangelizing and discipling nations? We want to see what unfolds and we want to be aligned to it in the way we do ministry so that the Holy Spirit can work through us to continue that work. So in one sense, the book of Acts is still being written. Now don't go and say pastor said Bible is still being written. That's what I'm saying. We know the canon of Scripture is closed, but what we are saying is the Holy Spirit is still working through the church. So that is continuing. So in that sense, the Book of Acts is still being expressed through you and me, through God's people all over the world in our day and time. Still happening. Still being expressed. Amen. So our goal is Holy Spirit come. fill us and make us that community that you want us to be so that we can be the church that Jesus wants us to be and we can disciple the nations that you want us to disciple the work that you want us to do please work it through us we want to be in a place where we can make ourselves available so we pick up today in acts chapter 3 So this is a few months and nobody knows exactly how many months later some say 3 months 4 months so you can imagine now we are kind of 3 months or 4 months after pentecost time is gone the community of believers at that time were only Jews but it was multicultural multilingual 
because these were Jewish people who were not just locals. There were a few who were from Jerusalem. But so many had come from other parts of the world. They'd come from northern Africa, Egypt. They'd come from Persia, or what would be modern-day Iraq and Iran and uh, Syria and Jordan and Turkey. They'd come from all those regions across the Mediterranean, from the islands in the Mediterranean. They'd gone across from Europe, all the way from Rome. So they're people from all different parts of the Roman Empire. So obviously, they, 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 while they all spoke Greek, they would also speak languages in the places where they were living. They probably had some adaptations to the culture and the places where they were living. So they all gathered together. They were all in Jerusalem, this early church. They were all Jews, but they were still multicultural, multilingual, somewhat like us here at All People's Church, right? Like that. But they, the common denominator was they're all Jews at that time. And therefore, they still continued in their Jewish customs. They were still Jews. But they had believed in Jesus. They had received the Holy Spirit. But they continued with their Jewish traditions and customs. And they prayed three times a day. Nine o'clock in the morning, called the third hour of the day. Twelve noon, called the sixth hour. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour of the day. So Acts 3 begins by telling us that Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. That was part of their custom. They were going to pray, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, if they had gone by this to the temple many times to pray, this was not the first time they're going to the temple. They've been doing this for at least four or five months. And before that, when they were with the Lord Jesus, they also accompanied Jesus through these very gates. When Jesus was ministering, and they were observers there, or they were assistants to the Lord Jesus in His ministry. So this was not the first time they were going into the temple to pray. They'd done it many, many, many times. Probably the previous day as well. They come to pray. But today was different. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Peter and John are walking up into the temple. They come to the gate called Beautiful. Now, uh, what scholars would tell us is this temple gate must have been the gate of Nicanor because... That particular gate was highly ornate. It had bronze gates that were highly decorated. And so that was the gate of the temple they probably came into. Now just a little bit of understanding what the temple looked like at that time. So it was called the second temple or Herod's temple. The first temple built by Solomon, destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, rebuilt later on, you know, when the, after they came back from the captivity under Nehemiah, Ezra, and others rebuilt. Then when King Herod became king, he extended the temple uh, complex and the temple mount. They say it extends up to about 400 acres. So the temple complex itself, you see the model. It's not the real picture. It's just a model of the temple complex. The bottom of the picture is actually east, not south. It's east, the bottom of the picture. So in your mind, just tilt it right. So the bottom of the temple is actually east. So they would come in through the gate. So you enter the temple complex. And if you look at the temple complex, you see all around the temple complex that are actually pillars. There, is a corridor, there are corridors all around. The eastern corridor, passageway with the pillars, that was called referred to Solomon's porch. So that's the walkway on the east side, which had the entrance there. That was referred to as Solomon's porch. So you walk in through the main entrance into the temple complex. You come into what is called as the outer court or the court of the Gentiles. And then you enter through the beautiful gate. You come in the beautiful gate. So people, the outer court, anybody could come in. And so there were beggars and others sitting outside there in the gate of the entrance, the gate called Beautiful. You pass through the gate of beautiful and you come into what was called as the women's, women's court. Women were allowed up until that space. And then you see the stairs going up. There's another gate. And you come into what was known as the courts of Israel. That was where men, men were allowed to come in up until that space. 
And then you had another entrance, which was right into the inner sanctum of the temple, which only the priests were allowed to go. So that was the holy of whole, uh, uh, the, uh, the holy place, and then the most holy place, or uh, uh, the holy of holies. So only the priests were allowed to go there. So Acts 3 happens right at that gate called Beautiful, that separated the outer court from the women's court. You all with me so far? You lost somewhere in the court? <laughs> okay, you're at the gate. All right. <laughs> so we're at the gate called Beautiful. Outside, there are lots of people begging, sick people. And that day was very different. Peter and John walking by. Peter sees this lame. And he's seen him before. He's seen all these people before. But that day was different. Suddenly. And I'm just trying to imagine what would have happened. So imagine with me. Don't ask me for chapter and verse. <laughs> imagine what happens. Suddenly, he must have felt the Spirit of God moving on him. He must have felt a surge of faith just going up to a new level, something he not experienced before. And he looks at this lame man and he says, makes his bold statement, look at us. So this man looks up and says, thinking, you know, he's going to give me some money or something. And Peter makes this statement, silver and gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. And that sounds very arrogant. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit had awakened in him that sense of knowing you've got something in you, Peter. You've got the name of Jesus and you've got what Jesus said. The power of the Holy Spirit is in you. So he said, look at me. What I have, I give you. Silver and gold, I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he didn't stop with that. He went on to take him by the right hand and pull him up. And all of a sudden, at that moment, the power of God went through his body. His feet and ankle bones received strength. And this man who had been lame, was born lame 40 years. He's probably been sitting there for 20 years. I mean, I, I don't know. They could have brought him there from the age of 20 on. So he must have been begging there for at least 20 years. They, and this man suddenly recognizes that, the power, that something has happened to his body. He can now stand. He starts taking his first few steps. And he goes running through that gate into that the women's court where people are. That lots of people gathered. And he goes jumping, shouting, screaming, and praising God. And at that moment... Peter and John quietly slip away and they go to the outer corridor, that is Solomon's porch. They were going in to pray, but this man got healed. So they said, hey, we'll go the other way. So they actually withdraw them so very quietly into Solomon's porch, which is the corridor on the eastern side, and they're there. And this man is making loud, loud noise. I'm sure he comes running for Peter and John. Hey, where are they? And he comes and he holds on to Peter and John. Hey, you guys, you're not getting away. And the crowd comes. They move all the, you know, they move all the way into the outer court and into Solomon's porch. They all gathered. They're amazed at what had happened. A big crowd gathered. Now, some questions will go through our minds. Why didn't Jesus heal this man? Because Jesus had been into the temple so many times. In fact, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 21 that one day Jesus went into the temple, the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. And this man didn't get healed or he probably didn't even go there. Why didn't Peter and John heal him the day before or any time before? Why did it happen, have to happen that day? Now, our response would be this. God heals in so many different ways. There is one way that God heals, which is open to all of us, which is you come to Him in faith. Believe His word. Receive. It's open to all of us. It's an open invitation. And in Jesus' ministry, people came to Him. Multitudes came to Him over and over again. Like even the four friends who brought that man who was paralyzed. It came to Jesus. And he healed. He never turned anybody away. He healed all who came to him. So that's open for everybody. But in addition to that, we see 
that God heals through the gifts of His Holy Spirit. There are the gifts of healings, the working of miracles, and the gift of faith. But those operate as the Spirit wills. Like, I don't have the key, neither do you have the switch for it. We are vehicles, we're instruments, we can desire it, we can commit it, but they operate as the Spirit wills. And in addition to that, God, there are, there are times when God moves sovereignly. He releases His presence and His power as He desires. So for example, in John 5, Jesus goes by the pool of Bethesda. There are so many people lying there. He goes to one man who doesn't even know who Jesus is. And He says, do you want to be well? And He's not even thinking about Jesus healing him. He's thinking about somebody throwing him into the pool. But at that moment, Jesus says, take your bed and walk. And then Jesus' answer to that is in John 5, 19. He says, I can do nothing of myself, but whatever I see the Father do, that's what I do. But yet when he went out to preach, multitudes came to him and he healed them. So there are diversities of operations. There are different ways in God works. And what we can say is on that day, that three o'clock, that afternoon, the Holy Spirit decided. Why? Because he's God. Nobody else controls that. He decided, I'm going to do this now. And he moved on Peter. Peter was responding. Of course, he had to do something. He responded. He recognized the Holy Spirit moving on him. He recognized faith rising up. You know, five minutes later, we'll say, Peter, would you like to try it again? He said, not now. No, we don't do this on our own. It's as the Spirit moves on us, right? And so that's what happened. So we get back to this place where Peter and John are standing in Solomon's porch and this whole crowd is gathered and they're all waiting. What happened? And Peter says, it's time to preach. I've got an audience. And Peter begins. And notice how he starts his message, Acts chapter 3. He says, you men of Israel, why do you look at us so intently? I want to highlight. Acts 3 verse 4, he says, look at us. Here he's saying, don't look at us. Look at us. It's okay for us to tell the world, you come, we'll pray for you. You come, we will minister to you. You come, there is something we carry that we can give to you. It's okay for us to say that. Come. But we also say, don't fix your eyes on us. It's not because of us. So he tells the people, you men of Israel, why do you look at us as though by our own power or by our own holiness? In other words, it's not our power, it's not by our holiness. No, don't gaze on us. So you come to us because some, there is something we have that we can give. So yes, we can invite people. We can say, come, I'll pray for you. Come, I'll, 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 maybe I can give you God's word. Maybe I can pray for you in the name of Jesus. I can do that. But when they receive something, we point them to Jesus. And that's what Peter did. That's the first thing he did. He said, it's not by our power. It's not by our onlyness, but the God of Abraham, the God of your fathers. He has exalted His Son, Jesus. So He's pointing to Jesus. So what, what purpose does miracles serve? Of course, miracles help the people. But they act as signs and wonders. They act as signs that make us wonder about this God. And that was what was happening. He said, look at Jesus. And he uses three very interesting titles for Jesus there in Acts 3. He says, he is the Holy One, the just, and the Prince of Life. You crucified the Holy One, the blameless, the one who is sinless and perfect. He is the just one, sinless one. And he is the author of life. He's a prince of life. He's a source of life. You crucified this person. But God has raised him up. Acts 3.16. And his name. 
through faith in his name. Faith given to us by God has made this man strong. So he's saying, this is it. His name. Faith in his name. Faith that God put in our hearts. That's how this man stands here perfectly whole. Amen. And Acts 3.16, very important verse. It's a scripture that you and I must hold in our hearts because Jesus has given to us his name. He's given to us his name. The right to use that name. And we must have faith in that name. And the authority and the power of that name. Have faith in that name. His name. Through faith in that name. And faith given to us from God. Has made this man perfectly whole. So we cooperate with God. He's given to us that authority. But we must believe. We must have faith. We must step out and minister in faith. Are you with me? And then... He gives the invitation. He says, repent and be converted. Acts 3 verse 18. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that Jesus will come. So think about this. Repent and be converted. Repent means literally to change your mind. To be converted literally means to change your lifestyle. So repentance, true repentance, always leads to true conversion. A true change of mind will always lead to a real change in life. Repent and be converted. And what will happen? Your sins will be blotted out. Now, you've got to compare this with Acts 2, 38 and 39, the altar call that he gave in his very first sermon. So it's repent and be converted and your sins will be blotted out. Now, I try to imagine what this would mean to the Jewish minds. Because for them, they kept coming to the temple with sacrifices for their sins. They kept on coming. Year after year, they bring a cow, I mean, not cow, but they bring a goat or they bring some animal or some bird. They come to offer sacrifices for their sins. And now Peter is saying, repent, be converted, and your sins will be blotted out. Something new. You don't have to keep coming back, but you believe in this Jesus and your sins will be blotted out. It's a change in their thinking. They've got to move to this. And then he said, times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. What was he talking about, times of refreshing? You, you draw a parallel to what he said in Acts 2, 38 and 39. If you repent and be baptized, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is referencing as times of refreshing. From the presence of the Lord. You all with me so far? Acts 3 verse 19. Times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is also referred to as times of refreshing from the presence of God. Like we said last time, this is going to be a repeatable experience. It's going to happen over and over and over again through the book of Acts. And so, for you and me, when we need to be refreshed, revived, renewed in our spiritual journey, God's got something. Times of refreshing. That's why we pray, God, pour out your spirit afresh on me. Or whatever language you want to use, or however you want to word your prayer. Basically saying, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit again. I need a fresh outpouring of your spirit. I need, fill me afresh with your spirit. I need that. And that brings renewing, reviving to our lives. Keeps us going. Are you with me? 
So God does this over and over and over again. When life gets, I'm talking about our spiritual journeys, gets a little dry, gets a little dusty, gets a little boring. Hey, you need a fresh outpouring. You need this time of refreshing that comes from the presence of God. But God's got that ready. He's got that. So when we repent and are converted, we are positioned now for this recurring, happening over and over again, time of refreshing from the presence of God. We just go before God, I need another outpouring. I need a fresh outpouring. I need a renewing. God, pour out your spirit on me afresh. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Times of refreshing. And he said the third thing will happen. So that Jesus will come again. So the salvation of souls is connected to the return of our Lord Jesus. Because this gospel must be preached to all the nations. And then the end will come. And also because Romans eleven twenty five, 25, Paul says... That the, the fullness of the Gentiles must be gathered together. The full measure of Gentiles. God is waiting for people. He's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. And so he's waiting for more and more people to come in. And then Jesus will come. So salvation, every soul being saved is actually getting us closer and closer to the coming of Jesus. Are you with me? So he said, come, you got to repent, be converted. And then he continues about Jesus, and he makes this interesting statement. Whom the heavens must retain until the times of the restoration of all things. Acts 3, I think it was 21. That means Jesus must, will be in heaven until The times of restoration of all things. So what is the times of restoration? Now, if you you do some study and you compare some versions, it could be positioned in two ways and and, and both are correct. For instance, the Passion Translation would put it like this. Until all things have been restored. Jesus will be in heaven until all things have been restored. Many other versions will put it like this, like, for example, the Good News Bible and others. They'll put it like this. Jesus must be in heaven until the time comes for all things to be restored. And both are correct. One, there is the restoration of things, primarily in the church, in the people of God. The church is being brought to a place Or God's people are being brought to a place where they will be the glorious church. So things have to be restored. And how been restored? About 100 years ago or less than 100 years ago, if you went back to the 1950s or prior, just prior to that, people didn't know what, about, they didn't see much of the office of the evangelist, the pastor or the teacher or the prophet or the apostle. They didn't see too much of that. The church was just being restored. But over the last 50, 60 years, all of these fivefold offices have been restored in the church, are functioning in the church. And, and the church is coming to a place of greater glory. It's coming to a place where the Bible, Ephesians 5 says, it'll be a glorious church. No spot, no wrinkle. So all things are being restored. But also the time will come which the Father has in His own hands when He says, Now is the time to begin the restoration of all things. And it begins there in Revelation, the 20th chapter, when Jesus comes and He sets up His kingdom here on earth. The very nature of things will change. The lion will lie down with the lamb. The child will play next to a snake's hole. And and the very nature of things will change. People will beat their swords into plowshares. And that will be the millennial reign of Jesus. And then it will climax with a new heavens and a new earth. Are you with me? So both understandings are right. But Peter says, Jesus will be in heaven until the times of the restoration of all things. And then in that sermon, in his sermon, 
Peter does something wonderful. Three times, he t- reminds the people, he says, you know what? The prophets have spoken. They have foretold about these days. The prophets have spoken. In other words, what's happening right now are things which the prophets have already spoken about. He said, go check your scriptures. Go see your scriptures. The prophets have spoken about this. So that got the attention of the Jewish people. That means, hey, what the prophets spoke is happening right now, and I want you to see it. And he reminds them about Moses. He says, even Moses said, God will raise up a prophet. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15, 18, and 19. He says, God will raise up for you a prophet like unto myself, and you got to listen to him. Say, hey, look, Moses said that, and this Jesus is that prophet. And they said, Abraham, God promised to Abraham. And he said, God told Abraham, Abraham, through your seed, I will bless the nations. And this Jesus is that seed. He's come to bless you first by offering you forgiveness of sins. Can't you see it? So that's Peter's sermon. Beautiful. Pointing to Jesus. Telling them what they will receive when they repent and are converted. Telling them that this Jesus is the very one whom the prophets have foretold. Inviting them. You all with me? We're at the end of Acts chapter 3. So now we step into chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Verses 1 to 3. So Peter preaches to them about the resurrection of Jesus. So while Peter is preaching, the crowds are listening. They're seeing this man here who's been totally healed. They know this man's 40 years of age. We've seen him. He's completely healed. There comes the police. The temple guard. Hey, things are out of control. Now they are next in charge of the temple after the high priest. They are in charge. They come. They've probably been sent there by the high priest. And they apprehend Peter and John. Arrest them. Take them away. But, the Bible says, that day, the news spread, and 5,000 more people came to faith in Jesus. Amen? So you can imagine now, day of Pentecost, 3,000, many more saved, maybe grew to 4,000. Some months later now, 3,000 or 5,000 more. It says men. So, you know, if you can assume that when men, they would have gone home and told their family, hey, from now on, we have decided to believe in Jesus because we saw this miracle. We saw, we heard Peter telling us, we've got to believe in Jesus. Jesus is the prophet. Moses spoke about everything. And, you know, you can imagine not only the men, but the whole families would have decided to follow Jesus. You put all that together and you can estimate maybe 10,000, 12,000 people. In Jerusalem, believing in Jesus. Now that day, that night, you know, the miracle happened at 3 o'clock. So all this must have gone on till 6 p.m. So when Peter and John were arrested, they couldn't do anything with them. They just put them quietly in jail. Say, we'll deal with this tomorrow. So next day, the Sanhedrin came together. Now just a little bit about the Sanhedrin. What is the Sanhedrin? So while the Romans were in power, they had allowed the Jews to have their own Jewish government to, care of, to take care of all the religious matters. The religious matters, you guys handle it. So the Sanhedrin, which comprised, about, comprised of the high priest, a lot of other priests, the scribes, the scholars of the law, the rabbis, And some of the very wealthy Jews, about 70 in all, about 70 or 71 if you count the high priest as well, they were the Sanhedrin. They were the local council of the Jewish government. They decided things. So next day, the Sanhedrin came together. 
What are we going to do with Peter and John? And most importantly, what are we going to do about this new movement that is, that is going around Jerusalem? So that year, so there was this high priest whose name was Annas. He had five sons and a son-in-law, and all, they took turns to be high priests. That year, his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was the high priest. Caiaphas was the high priest and at the trial of Jesus just a few months before. So here he is again, the high priest. So he's the person in charge. Of course, Annas, because he was a little older, must have been the unofficial head of the Sanhedrin. But that year, Caiaphas was the high priest. And we know that in this group of 70 people, there were two divisions. There were the Pharisees and there were the Sadducees. The Pharisees were a group of Jewish people who, they believed in the law of Moses. They believed in resurrection from the dead. They believed in the supernatural and miraculous and angels. They were strict followers of the Mosaic law and that were, those were the Pharisees. And then there were the Sadducees. They were slightly different or very different. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the supernatural, in the angels and so on. But they were aristocracy. They were the affluent people, wealthy people who were part of the Sanhedrin. So the priests had to listen to them because they had the money. And that was the group that was sitting together. What we also know that in that group was a man named Gamaliel. He was a very reputed scholar, a teacher, and everybody wanted to learn from Gamaliel. He was there. We'll read more about him in, 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 in the coming chapters. And also in that group was a man named Saul who later would become the great apostle, Paul. But he was there. So how do you know Saul was there? Because, as we will see later in chapter 4, the only way Luke could have known what the Sanhedrin was discussing was because many years later, Saul, who became Paul, would have said, Luke, I want to give you inside information. I was sitting there, trying to discuss what to do with Peter and John. This is what we discussed. And look, sir, I'll take notes. <laughs> so he wrote it down for us. But you can imagine the Sanhedrin. And they bring Peter and John the next morning. And I want you to think about this. This was the elite, the intellectual, the scholars, the wealthy people, the powerful people. Two things they did not do. They did not dispute the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What were the apostles preaching? Jesus Christ whom you crucified. The Holy One, the Just One, the Prince of Life. God has raised Him from the dead. And His name, through faith in His name, has healed this man. They did not dispute the resurrection. This was the same Sanhedrin who paid the Roman soldiers. They gave them money. They said, hey, you know, you go tell the people that these disciples came and stole the body or did something. Keep quiet. Disappear. They paid them. But they did not dispute the resurrection. They could have called Peter and John and said, hey, what are you talking about? Peter and John, you're saying Jesus rose from the dead. Look at the tomb. The tomb is there. His body is there. They couldn't do that. They had no way to dispute the resurrection of Jesus. And they did not even try. Second, they did not counter the miracle. This lame man was there. They said, we cannot say anything against it, knowing that a notable miracle has taken place. There is no way to disprove it. And all the people are glorifying God. With all due respect to medical doctors today, they come up with excuses. You say, hey, the tumor disappeared. Oh, no, no, no. Maybe the first scan was not done properly. 
Maybe you didn't go to the right place to get the scandal. They have all, they'll have their arguments. So when I, I, I got hit, the tumor was, this scan says the tumor was there. This scan says tumor is gone after prayer. No, no, that scan is questionable. I, they didn't do it properly. That's why you're saying it's gone. It wasn't there in the first place. So all this argument, modern day. But think about the Sanhedrin. This man was there. They knew he was lame. And now he's healed. They couldn't dispute it. So two things they didn't fight against. The resurrection of Jesus and the healing of the lame man. They had only one question. Peter and John, by what power or by what authority are you doing this? In other words, hey, is there any black magic going on here? I mean, are you doing something that we don't know about? Please, what power, what authority? How are you doing this? You're not questioning what was done. They're not questioning the resurrection of Jesus. How are you doing? What power, what authority? Peter says, now's my chance. <laughs> so he says, let it be known to you. That Jesus whom you crucify. And then he quotes from Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected. Has, been become, has become the chief cornerstone. In other words. The Jesus that you rejected. God has exalted him. Let it be known to you today. That it is in his name. That this man stands here. Perfectly whole. And as if that was not enough, he gives them a left hook. Acts 4.12. And there is no salvation in any other name. Because there is no other name given under heaven among men by which you can be saved. Sanhedrin, I want you to know it's the name of Jesus. The one you rejected, God has exalted him. And it's only in his name. This man has been healed. And it's only in his name that there is salvation. What a bold statement. All these religious leaders. Telling them straight in their face. There's only one name for salvation. It's the name of Jesus. Acts 4.13. Beautiful verse. It says... So you can imagine these 70 people, highly educated, scholarly, wealthy, powerful. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they noticed that these were unlearned and ignorant men. I mean, these are not schooled. They're not trained. How could they be so bold? Where could they get this courage? They're standing before the 70 people, two men, fishermen from Galilee. And they are unashamed, unalarmed, and they are bold. Where could they get this courage? They said, oh, they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. That's what being with Jesus will do to you and me. Amen? That's what being with Jesus will do to you and me. When we know the Jesus we believe in, when we let Him grip our hearts, when we let Him feel us, it makes us bold, confident, fearless. That's what Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin. And they said, okay, can you excuse us a little bit? Please go out. And 17 men are trying to decide what to do. With these two unlearned, ignorant men. They're trying to figure out how do we stop this move that's, cap that's just going all across the city. People are talking about Jesus and the Sadducees were very afraid because they are saying he rose from the dead. They're, they're even more upset about this. What do we do? Once again, they did not question the resurrection. They did not question the miracle. The only thing, after all the discussion, said, we will threaten them. We will threaten them. 
Don't preach and teach in the name of Jesus. So Peter and John come back. They come back. And I can just imagine Peter and John having a conversation. John is like, hey, Peter, you got us into this. <laughs> what are you going to tell them? And I'm sure Peter said, hey, John, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10? You will be brought before the elders and the leaders in the synagogues. And they'll bring you before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But don't worry what you will say because the Holy Spirit will give you in that very moment what you need to say. I'm sure Peter, they would have had some discussion going on. And okay, John. So there they come in. The Sanhedrin says, okay, Peter and John, we've decided we are issuing an order that you must not teach and preach in the name of Jesus. And John looks at Peter and says, I wonder what he's going to say now. And even before John can bat an eyelid, Peter says, hey guys, oh, I'm not sure he didn't say that. But he says, I want you to think, what's more important? Should we obey God or should we obey man? In other words, sorry, I can't follow that instruction. You're telling us not to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. You decide. Because Jesus told us to go preach in His name to all the nations. And I'm committed to it. And you're saying don't. Whom should we obey? God or man? You decide. And they walked out. And that, amen? That's what they did. Thank God they took that stand there. And we can draw inspiration and say, that's what we will do in our day and time. We will proclaim Jesus. You say what you want. Of course, we'll do it wisely. Yeah, we will, we will we'll be respectful. But we will proclaim Jesus. So they went back to their own company. I'm getting ready to close. Worship team, please come. They went back to their own company and they shared, you know, this is what happened. And they all got together. They prayed. Oh God. Look at their threats. And then they quoted scripture to the Lord. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do the heathen imagine a vain thing? I mean, in other words, you know, Psalm 2 says, when people that yet are trying to do things against God and against His anointed, it says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Can you imagine? That man is trying to do things to stop the spread of the gospel. God is sitting in heaven laughing. That's what they quoted, Psalm 2. He who sits in there. Why do the heathen rage? Why do they imagine a vain thing? Because they have taken this thing against God and His anointed. To whom God already said, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth for your position. God has already decided He's going to give the nations as an inheritance to His anointed one, Jesus Christ. Nothing man can do can stop it. Already done. So they quote Psalm 2. Oh God, you've said this. And their prayer is a prayer that you and I must pray. They said, God, grant to us your servants that with all boldness we will speak. God, in other, put it in simple English, God, help us to stay bold. We don't want to get fearful about their threats. So give us boldness. That's what they pray. And that's what you and I can pray. When we face threats, we face opposition, we face all these kinds of things. God, grant to your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word. God, we don't want to go down in boldness we want to go up in boldness we want to be even more bold and the second thing they pray which you and I can pray God stretch out your hand to heal so that signs and wonders may be done in the name of your holy servant Jesus in other words God give us more of these notable miracles give us more of these things let mighty miracles take and that's what you and I can pray God give us boldness God, give us more signs and wonders. 
That's the kind of church you and I should be. Amen. And it says when they prayed like that, the place was shaken. And it was God said, yeah, I honor that. And they went out and they preached. They were preached boldly in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, Acts 4 verse 33, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was on them all. Great power, great grace. May we be a church like that with great power and great grace. Amen. Let's pray. Let's ask God for those things. And just a few more thoughts here. And what else did they do? Now imagine now you've got about 10,000, 12,000 people. Most of these people didn't plan to stay in Jerusalem. They were from out of town. So they came with limited supplies. So they had to address the need. And spontaneously, as the Holy Spirit moved on them, the Bible says, people who had lands and possessions, they went and sold what they had. Beautiful. In the Old Testament, there is a... God expresses His heart in Deuteronomy 15 verse 4. He says, I do not want any person to be poor. Deuteronomy 15 verse 4. I don't want any person to be poor among His people, among His people. And here, they were Jewish people. They knew the scriptures. They were working out a very practical way to make sure everybody's needs were met. And people went and sold what they had. They brought the money. I'm not saying everybody did it because we know, for instance, Mary, who was the mother of John Mark, she didn't sell her house because later on they had a prayer meeting in the house. So I'm not saying everybody did it. But those who felt led by God, that the Holy Spirit moved, they went and did it. Another thing, and this was, we saw this in Acts 2, seeing it here again. Another thing, they came and laid the money at the apostles' feet. What I do want to point out is, the Bible says, and they gave to everybody. So the apostles didn't collect it and buy three houses, four cars, five planes. No. They, whatever was given to them, they gave to the people. So that's what leadership is supposed to do. Leadership in the church should be worthy of trust, of even in finances. The reason you give your tithes and offerings here, I'm not, you're not going to take up an offering. I'm just talking about the offering. The reason you give is because you trust that we will make good use of this to serve the purposes of God. And that's what we do. That's what they did. They came and they put the money at the apostles' feet and they took it to meet the needs of, no, this was more than 10,000 people. That's a big community. Many of them had nothing in Jerusalem. So they took care of those needs. And the last thing we see in Acts 4, last few verses, is a mention of a man named Joseph. I know we have a Joseph here. But the apostles called him Barnabas. They gave him a name, Barnabas. Because Joseph was a Levite from Cyprus, an island in the Mediterranean. He stayed on now he had land in Cyprus in his home place so he went sold the land brought the money gave it and it says here they gave him the name Barnabas because he was an encourager so you can just imagine he was just going hey encouraging the people maybe speaking words of encouragement maybe you know giving them some I don't know many different ways but he was just an encourager But this same Barnabas becomes a very important person as we journey forward. He becomes an apostle along with Paul. He started off as an encourager. 
I want to keep I want you to keep this in mind and we're going to see this happen we're going to hear about many more people they all started in simple ways Stephen Philip they just doing something small Barnabas just encouraged him. maybe he was sending whatsapp messages hey be of good cheer be happy smile I don't know just cheering people up but one day this man was going to be an apostle with Paul so you and I never know we may be doing something small something simple just being an encouragement but that's your preparation for greater things amen let's rise to our feet please next Sunday five and Please take some time to read it. Come because, you know, we're compressing two chapters in 40, 40 minutes or something. Let's pray. May we live the book of Acts. May the same Holy Spirit who moved 2,000 years ago through the early church in Jerusalem, may He move in a similar way, in a greater way through us today may notable miracles take place so that we give testimony to our living Christ may we be filled with that same holy boldness that Peter and John had because they took time to be with Jesus may we take time to be with Jesus So that when our time comes up to stand, we will stand. Unshaken, unalarmed, unashamed, bold, we will stand. Because we've been with Jesus. We know Him. Like the church, may we pray, Lord, grant us boldness. And God, stretch out your hand to do mighty things. May there be great grace and great power amongst us like the church. And may there be many people like Barnabas and many other names we're going to see like Philip and Stephen and Agabus and Silas and John Mark and Mary and many others be raised up amongst us as the Holy Spirit moves in our midst Father we invite the Holy Spirit to move amongst us even now touch and heal ignite rekindle refresh renew God do whatever each one needs here in this place and those watching online let's take a few moments just to worship and welcome him let him minister to us.
even now let the Holy Spirit move amongst us we ask Lord that you stretch out your hand to heal to deliver break bondages break afflictions and in that same name in that mighty name of Jesus let sicknesses and diseases and afflictions be healed let bodies be healed minds be made whole Let chronic illnesses be healed. Let blood conditions be healed. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let that same healing power, Lord, touch people in this auditorium and those watching online. Let every spirit of infirmity leave. Every demonic work of oppression and torment leave in the name of Jesus that the anointing of God break every yoke and remove every burden and Father we invite the work of the Holy Spirit to raise up amongst us men and women who will step into their calling who will step into their assignment that you have even though it may start off in simple, small ways, but they will begin their journey into your divine assignment on their lives and for the church, for your kingdom. Father, that from here, you raise up men and women who will impact the nations. That God, you'll raise up men and women who will be movers and shakers in their generation, among their people who will do things that will astound the minds of people that your word will be fulfilled that you take what is weak, confound what is strong you take what is foolish, you confound what is mighty you take what is nothing and you confound everything that's on the earth that you do such things God let the Holy Spirit move amongst us Moving people into their assignments. Moving people into their God-given purposes. Orchestrate things in our lives, in our circumstances, in our situations that will steer us to where you want us to be. To become what you want us to become and to fulfill what you want us to fulfill. We pray this, God, for each one. For each one. We thank you, God. So be open, be ready. I believe God is doing this. 
is moving us like chess pieces. Not at random, but very strategic, very purposeful. As God orchestrates things in your life, as He orders your steps, as He steers things in you, He's doing it in order to position you. To put you where you ought to be for the purpose He has for your life. So be ready. Be open. We thank you, God. Thank you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us always in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.